More than 180,000 people have come to New York seeking asylum, many of whom still reside in the city's shelters, but the city has given them an ultimatum, move out because you can't stay. But the problem is they've got nowhere else to go. Well, New York City reaching a settlement over its attempt to roll back parts of the right to shelter law. It will give the city more flexibility over how long migrant adults can remain in shelters. The settlement will ease the burden for a city shelter system stretched to its breaking point by thousands of arriving migrants. We have been clear since day one that the right to shelter was never intended to apply to large scale migrant populations. With 180,000 already arriving in the city and more expected, the migrant agreement limits the amount of time an adult can stay in shelter to 30 days and not reapply. This is an emergency. These are extraordinary circumstances. But, you know, without work permits, it's the case for many migrants that they need more than 30 or 40 days. But you just heard the city's spin on this deal today, which is we want you to move along. So it's taken about six months, but the city has finally made a deal to modify its right to shelter rules, which guarantee housing to everyone who asks. But what nobody's talking about is this victory won't just not solve New York's humanitarian crisis. Many of the people it affects are trapped here permanently and cannot leave the shelters. They've got nowhere else to go, which means they might end up living on the street or worse. They could join a gang or be forced into the criminal underworld. And on top of that, the city's been discovering illegal apartments all over town, crammed full of people in very tight living quarters. And this is happening happening because 98% of the people being asked to leave the shelters are unable to do so. And the thing nobody in leadership wants to admit is that the right to shelter rules have created a group of people totally dependent upon the government for survival. And asking those people to leave the shelter system isn't going to do anything. But before we look at why critics are saying this victory is actually a massive defeat for New York City, it's important to understand why city leaders are so excited to say that right to shelter is over when it really might just be getting started. So this right here is the door to the Candler building, an 800 bed single adult shelter for men where the residents are soon gonna be affected by the city's rule changes. Sadly, turning many of the shelters meant to help people into factories that produce homelessness. It's important to point out that these modifications are only temporary and will last only until the current humanitarian crisis ends. The underlying right to shelter law still remains in effect, so both sides are actually claiming victory. So the most important thing to know about these rule changes is that they are temporary. They're not permanent. For the city, the victory is that bed space and shelters like this can now be freed up for new arrivals. And humanitarians are glad that the city's right to shelter rule will continue to keep people from sleeping on the streets. On top of that, some people are controversially claiming that this means the asylum crisis is going to go on forever because now right to shelter has been defined by a court as something that applies to the entire world. Which means in the future, the city could be affected the same way by another humanitarian crisis. And it may be creating a crisis because all of the people it's caring for now have no Nowhere else to go. And some people say that defining right to shelter as something that applies to everybody, no matter where they're from, is an invitation for people to come to New York. But proponents say this is just a reinforcement of New York City's promise to take care of the less fortunate and downtrodden. But at the same time, this does make New York the first sanctuary city in America with a guaranteed right to housing, no questions asked. Unless the question is, have you already been living in a shelter like this one for 30 days? If the answer to that is yes, you'll have to move out. But again, temporary. But how long is it temporary for? There's no definition of when this crisis is over. Today is indeed a historic day. With 180,000 already arriving in the city and more expected, the migrant agreement limits the amount of time an adult can stay in shelter to 30 days and not reapply. So the right way to look at this is that, at least in the short term, it's going to help the mayor better manage a city that has been struggling since the beginning of this crisis. The mayor's been saying for months that the city can't sustain right to shelter forever. Especially for an unlimited number of people for an unlimited period of time. That's insane. No city could afford that unless they could print their own money, which we can't. But no one's talking about how this affects people who started their journey to the country at a time when right to shelter was guaranteed without that limit. And the thing is, you've got people who spent thousands of dollars and months coming here, leaving everything behind in most cases. After they arrive, they're given a spot in a shelter and all of those people right now are suddenly told, hey, you've got to go. 
it's time to go. Which means their lives have just been completely upended again after spending everything to come here in the first place. Does the city really want to make it easy for gang members to recruit people who have nothing and have lost everything? Because many of the folks affected by this can't get normal jobs. They've got to work under the table. And now they're being told they've got to survive on their own in a city with the highest rents in America. But before we get into the terrible options people are faced with after they get kicked out of one of these shelters, there are some legal ways that one would be able to stay. Because the city has a few exceptions they'll consider. An extenuating circumstance could be a situation where you are supposed to leave however you've signed a lease and you need 10 days to, uh, to go. We're gonna do that assessment on an individual basis. Okay, definitely reasonable to consider that not everybody who's supposed to move out will physically be able to. But is it possible that some of these exceptions may open up the system for abuse by those who are not well intended? Like the idea of extenuating circumstances. An extenuating circumstance could literally be anything. Just use your imagination. And of course, the people in the shelters who are being moved out do face tough circumstances. And a lot of people in the shelter system, again, don't have jobs, don't have any legal way of providing for themselves. Is that an extenuating circumstance? Probably not. I think the city already knows that or they wouldn't have gone through with this rule. So they're going to have to be very careful with what they approve and what they don't to figure out who's telling the truth and who might be taking advantage of the system. Is inviting people here under pretenses that turn out to be false even a good system to begin with? The city knew they couldn't afford this forever. Look at what they're doing to people. And the second extenuating circumstance has to do with making a good effort to find housing and not finding any. But what exactly does that mean? Renting an apartment in New York is impossible for pretty much everybody. You'll need a full-time job and good credit and verifiable income just to get something expensive and horrible. And if they're going to tell asylum seekers to move out of the shelters, but they're not going to provide any kind of housing assistance, I'm not really sure what a good faith effort that ends in success actually looks like. Would someone have to prove they visited every luxury apartment in town and got rejected because you couldn't prove you qualified to pay $5,600 a month rent? And this is where housing exploitation really gets scary because as people look for a place to stay, their only options are going to be these illegal type of apartments where they're charging $300 to let somebody sleep in a bunk bed in a room with 47 other people. And the third exemption has to do with medical. But how loosely is the city going to define a medical exemption? Like what if someone's being treated for something? What if they're on a prescription? What if they're scheduled for surgery? Would that person then have to move out? And is this an area of this new program that could be abused? Interestingly, the city provides free legal defense for people who have a mental disability or a physical disability and are being evicted. How that will affect situations like this is unknown at this point. Either way, it's frightening to think that thousands of people are now being told they've got to figure things out on their own after being told to a certain extent that they didn't have to, that they were going to be cared for. And some people say that city officials don't realize what this new rule change opens them up to in the future. large-scale migrant populations arriving without housing or legal work status. So on the one hand, this does give the city more tools to work with in the near term as far as who can stay and how long they can stay. But it doesn't cover families who are 78% of the current shelter population. But since reapplications are now blocked, this does end some of the perpetual nature of this crisis as far as the 22% of people it affects are concerned. But the mayor's critics are quite disappointed with him because late last year, the mayor said this crisis would destroy New York City. And when he went to court over the modification of right to shelter, many people thought he was going to ask for it to be taken away. But this now puts the city in a spot where its own laws are quite contradictory. And that's because late last year, New York sued Texas bus companies for bringing people to New York City for the purposes in the city's eyes of them claiming right to shelter. You're not allowed to bring someone here who then intends to become a shelteree, but anyone can come here and become a shelteree as long as they do it on their own volition. You just can't buy them their bus ticket. Now, I'm not saying the city should stop caring for people, and I certainly don't want to see people having to live on the street. That would be awful. But while the city is pushing through right to shelter eviction, 
eviction laws. They're also in the process of signing leases for and opening new shelters, like this 400-bed men's shelter in Gowanus, Brooklyn. The lease on this particular facility goes for the next nine years. So on the one hand, you've got the city saying, things are too expensive. We need a modification of right to shelter. And then on the other hand, they're taking the money that they do have and they're signing new deals for new shelters. It's like they're expanding the system while saying that it's grown too big, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Or it does make sense the city is expecting this crisis to go on for a while and to keep getting bigger in spite of this rule change. Under this agreement, the city will also need to eliminate the use of waiting rooms as shelters, which has forced some migrants to wait on chairs or floors. We end the practice that we've okay, that's a bit of an odd requirement. A few months ago, the city opened what are called respite centers so people could go inside and not freeze in the cold while waiting for a shelter bed to open up, which can sometimes take days or weeks. And if the city's still going to house people and they can still reapply for shelter and try to get an exemption, what on earth are they going to accomplish by not giving people a safe place to stay inside while they do that? And while the city continues to do this, it's also expanding its shelter system. And along with that, the system of ex exploitation that exists because of the dysfunctional shelters also gets bigger. For example, there was a gang of thieves using mopeds to steal purses and snatch phones from unsuspecting New Yorkers, and the leader of that gang found these people in the city's shelter systems. They're in a vulnerable position. And he told them, hey, you don't have to live in the shelters and eat shelter food. Just come and work for me. Yes, you'll have to commit crime to stay in this illegal apartment I have in the Bronx, but hey, it's better than where you're at. And look at these images of the illegal shelter with all the beds in that storefront basement. What if there was a fire or something in here? People are gonna get hurt, especially with all the e-bikes charging out back. And the other exploitation scheme has to do with illegal unregistered mopeds like this one. Anything like this in order to be legal has to have a license plate. But as you can see, this one doesn't, which means it could be used for any purpose. And we're not just talking about running red lights. If you're caught on camera driving one of these things and it doesn't have a plate and you do something wrong, it's gonna be hard to track you down, especially if you're wearing a helmet covering your face, hiding your identity. But the other scam going on with these seems a lot more legit. Until you realize that it's not, and it's just another way of taking advantage of people who have nothing. And it has to do with delivery apps. If you've got an illegal unregistered moped like this, and you've got a phone that has Uber installed on it with your social security number, there is now a black market for food delivery accounts. And that's because somebody without work authorization can rent that from you, and you can rent them your moped and get a cut of their earnings every every single week and since you've got the app and the money goes to your bank account. If you're not a good person, you'll just keep it. You won't even pay them. But in spite of these challenges, 98% of the people that have been evicted refuse to leave the city. Which means that by trying to solve one humanitarian crisis, the city may have inadvertently created another one. And it's not that people are ungrateful and they want to take advantage of the city. No, that has nothing to do with it. It has to do with the fact that applying for asylum in America is a long, arduous process. And let's say you're staying in the Candler Building shelter down the street when you file your application. Well, now that is the residence the government has on file connected with your application. And if you get on a bus and leave town and your address changes, that could screw up your entire application and you'll have to start the process over. Look, right now in Venezuela, it's 79 degrees. And the reason people were waiting on the streets for a shelter bed during the coldest months of the year wasn't because they enjoyed that, it's because they're stuck here. Back in October, the city even started a re-ticketing program that paid for free bus tickets for people. And they made it a requirement that if you want to reapply for shelter, you have to go to this reticketing facility and be offered a ticket before you can get another shelter placement. But once you understand that everybody who leaves is effectively canceling their application process, then it makes sense why so many people are refusing to leave. They can't leave. If they do, they have to start all over. It doesn't make any sense. But there's actually two other reasons people can't leave New York that nobody's talking about. help at the Senegalese Association of America, the small office located on 116th has a newfound level of need. Traditionally, a place for Senegalese immigrants to get resources, now it's packed constantly. So out of the two reasons why you don't see tons of people at the bus terminal leaving New York to get away from this awful shelter system, the first kind of makes a lot of sense. This is a big international city. And to some extent, even if the city didn't have a right to shelter program, people would still travel here because the ability to meet like-minded
like-minded people that you might share a cultural background or language with is much higher here than pretty much anywhere else in the country. Where else is there going to be a Senegalese office? And not only do these local organizations help people with their asylum-related paperwork, they can also help people connect with others in their same community, as well as give advice on where to go for things like medical assistance, food, and clothing. But although a certain amount of travel to New York would happen regardless of the city's rules, apparently, and I was shocked to find this out, the location that you use to apply for asylum dictates how likely you are to get approved. People applying for asylum in New York are three times more likely to get approved than somewhere else, like Texas or Florida. And that's likely because the asylum applications go before a court, and the courts in New York are not the same as the courts that are in Texas. And apparently between January and August of 2023, 61% of asylum applications in New York City were granted. The only place beating out New York was California. And if you and I can read articles like this on the internet, it would be foolish to assume that the people applying for asylum aren't also aware of this. And it makes sense that if people are aware that their applications have a higher chance of getting approved, they're gonna come to New York and apply, and they're not gonna come back to the bus terminal with a ticket elsewhere to leave before that process concludes. That wouldn't make any sense. You can't blame people for doing what's in their best interest. And even though the shelter system here is a disaster, you still get a place for 30 days, which is better than elsewhere. During that time period, you can apply for asylum, you can apply for work authorization, and you can do it with caseworkers that are more plentiful here than they are elsewhere. On top of that, New York is a sanctuary city, which means no one from the government here is concerned about your immigration status unless you do something really, really bad. And to further complicate matters, America's application process for asylum. It's the same as any application process. If you don't succeed the first time you get rejected, you can reapply and you don't have to do it in the same state or jurisdiction. Which could mean New York is a destination for reapplicants that failed in other states for some reason. Either way, New York City's attractiveness as a destination for immigrants isn't going away anytime soon. And sadly, the city's desire to free up shelter space for itself by evicting people means, yes, the asylum crisis might look a little bit better, but now the problem of homelessness looks worse. Which almost makes it appear like the city is rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, so to speak. Let's offload some of this asylum crisis into our homeless crisis, while at the same time expanding the shelter industrial complex. Speaking of which, many people are skeptical about how badly the parties vested in this crisis actually want it to end. Take the Candler building, for example. They're not losing any money because the city's got a new eviction process. In fact, I dare say that the asylum crisis is making facilities like this that are now shelters more money than ever. And the city's process of creating homelessness out of these very same facilities is making people rich. And that that doesn't mean the people that rented this facility to the city did something wrong. After all, the city came to them with the money and the building was empty, but it begs the question, how long is this going to go on for? And is the city accomplishing anything by telling people who've left everything to come here that they now have to leave and survive on their own in America's most expensive city? What do you think? Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.